Ladies and gentlemen, SmackDown Live tonight, man. SmackDown Live review is here. But if you guys missed yesterday's video, we did cover Monday Night Raw. Barely. I was barely awake for another insufferable edition of Monday Night Raw, which I am happy to announce to you that Monday Night Raw on Monday, and we will be talking about this on Off The Script, Monday Night Raw on Monday got even lower ratings than it did last week, which were, I believe, the lowest in its 25-year history for the show. They topped those numbers last night on Monday Night Raw. I hope you guys are clapping along with me, man. I really are. You guys can't see my smile. <laughs> oh my God, man. I love it. I think it's fantastic news, man. It, it is absolutely... It, it's it's the best news of my week. It really is. In, in a week where I'm going to the New York City Comic Con and I have House of Glory... And I'm going to be watching Conor McGregor versus uh, whomever it was, uh, Khabib, on Saturday, right, with my best friend. Got a lot going on this week, man. That is the shining beacon of my week. I'm glad. And then people, people are actually, they're actually making excuses as for why Monday Night Raw has the lowest ratings ever. Well, ratings don't matter. They've, they've been number three on the cable networks for the last couple of weeks. If I'm WWE and I'm number three, I'm taking that as good news. The company's making all these types of money. The stock is what at $100 a share. This is the shit that I got to hear. And then the newest one. Well, everybody's going to a streaming service now. They're watching it on Hulu. And they're watching it on, on uh, illegal sites. But they're still getting their raw fix and they're still watching the show. Really now? This is what we're, this is what we're doing. Boy, you really want to, you really must want to get your cock in the door at WWE. But if you want a realist, if you want someone who's going to spit the facts about Monday Night Raw and why it sucks, then you're going to go watch my review. Do it. Over 2,000 likes, man. Thank you guys so much. That is the goal for SmackDown Live tonight. 2,000 likes. Now, if you haven't already hit the thumbs up, I don't know what the fuck you're waiting for. I really don't know what the fuck you're doing. Like, you are not taking control of your life and, and making the right decisions. So, before you do anything, you got to hit that thumbs up. And then you're going to leave me a comment down below. And then you're going to go on social media and follow me on Twitter. At JD from NY206. Man, SmackDown Live tonight. I I've never seen little effort into a particular go home show than I did. To well, actually, I have. That's a lie. That is a bold faced lie, man. I have seen WWE put little effort into go home shows. Um, I, I would say the best way for me to explain this, and I really, I really wasn't even going to come on here and, and do a review, I was actually going to watch the Cubs game. And uh, kind of screw it to Llama, my buddy Buff Llama, because he's a big Cubs fan. I was going to watch them get shut out for the rest of the night. I would rather the Cubs than the Rockies. I don't know, but something about the Rockies, man, that, the, that don't sit, sit well with me. They scare me. Now, I don't, I don't anticipate or expect the Braves to get past the Dodgers, but if they do, uh, I would much rather play uh, the Rockies. But maybe the Rockies are the best bet to eliminate the Brewers. Because to me, the Brewers are the most scariest team in, uh, in the National League. I don't want to play them. Anyway. That's neither here nor there, man. We're not talking about the MLB. i never seen a go-home show for a pay-per-view that tried to do so much. But there was little substance there. Like, they tried to get you excited about the pay-per-view with Daniel Bryan and The Miz... And Becky Lynch and Charlotte Flair and Samoa Joe and AJ Styles. They, they tried to do so much, yet there was so little. I didn't find anything to be entertaining on this show whatsoever. I'm not saying that it was 
as bad as Monday Night Raw. I'm not saying that. Don't misconstrue my words. I'm just saying that this show really, really, really lacked excitement. So, uh, that's pretty much SmackDown Live. Now, AJ Styles and Samoa Joe were not there. The big storyline going into this show, or one of the big storylines going into this show, was Samoa Joe and AJ Styles. Samoa Joe showing up at the Styles household and ringing the doorbell and wanting to pay Wendy Styles a visit. But we didn't get any continuation to that on behalf of Samoa Joe. All we got was Paige, and I'm going to play the promo here, where she opened SmackDown Live and addressed Samoa Joe, uh, which was completely fucking ridiculous. They went on to say, and I quote, Samoa Joe's actions were the most heinous in WWE history. Now, I understand you have to sell a pay-per-view, but to blatantly lie to your audience and to be that misinformed and to pretty much say, fuck you, history, we don't give a shit about what you did or who you are, it's, it's kind of wrong. It's kind of bullshit. It was not the most heinous act in WWE history. We didn't even see Samoa Joe enter the household. All he did was ring the doorbell and take a selfie next to AJ Styles' mailbox. Apparently, AJ Styles' electric bill was a week late. They didn't even follow up. So how could it be the most heinous act in WWE history? And for this act, people in management, quote-unquote, wanted to fire Samoa Joe. Really now. Uh, I didn't hear anything about Braun Strowman being fired when he tried to throw Roman Reigns off or actually did throw Roman Reigns off a loading dock, loading dock while strapped to a fucking gurney. I, I didn't hear Braun Strowman possibly getting fired after flipping a fucking ambulance over. I didn't hear Braun Strowman getting fired or, uh, or Roman Reigns getting fired, for that matter, as he tried to uh, kill Braun Strowman with vehicular homicide, smashing an ambulance into a fucking brick wall, while Braun Strowman, bloodied and battered, crawled away. No, but we want to fire Samoa Joe for taking a fucking selfie next to AJ Styles' mailbox. Really makes sense there, WWE. Really makes a lot of sense. You want me to believe in the storyline, but then you want to put the storyline on TV the last week before we got to go to Australia with all these fucking loopholes and all this fucking stupidity. Not really going to get me excited. I was already there. You kind of brought me down a peg with the stupidity that uh, Paige uttered on SmackDown Live. But that was the big thing going into this show. You know, on top of that, the Aiden English stuff, which we'll talk about, which also disappointed me. You know, it kind of disappointed me, and then again, it didn't which we'll talk about because we barely got anything today. And the way that they doctored the footage with Aiden English, it really left a lot to be desired. But I don't want to skip ahead here, man. Let's start with Samoa Joe and AJ Styles. Paige opens SmackDown Live tonight, ready to fire Samoa Joe for taking a fucking selfie next to AJ Styles' mailbox. Let's listen to what Paige had to say. Just to let everyone know the Styles family is okay, as soon as the video stopped, we sent authorities to that house straight away. Samoa Joe did not enter the house. But reports were filed and charges were pressed against Samoa Joe for trespassing. I was trying to figure out how I'm going to manage this week, so I spoke to WWE management and they all came to a unanimous decision. Samoa Joe should be fired. Really? It's quite interesting. But before I made that decision and made that call, I gave another person a call. AJ Styles. I wanted to personally tell him the news and make sure his family were okay. 
But I felt his pain, I felt his emotion while I was speaking to him, my heart went out to him. No man should be in that situation with his family. No man. But then he said something to me that I never thought he was gonna say. He said, Paige, I'm dropping the charges. And then he begged me not to fire Samoa Joe. Oh, so what AJ Styles is doing is he's he begging to lose the WWE title. That's what he's doing. That he would disappear and he couldn't get his hands on him. And I agree. So then he asked me. Then he asked me. I want to hand stupid. out the punishment to Samoa Joe. And I said, that's crazy, but I agree. So therefore... This Saturday at Super Showdown, the match between him and Samoa Joe is on. But before the show, AJ Styles wanted you guys to see this clip, so here it is. I want to apologize for not being at SmackDown Live tonight. It's just under these circumstances with everything that's going on, I just don't think I'd be able to perform tonight. This is bigger than WWE. Samoa Joe has AJ Styles on strings, man. I don't want to do something stupid, get emotional, and do something I regret. That's why I'm at my house tonight. And I'm not leaving until I get confirmation that Samoa Joe is on a plane to Australia. I've got four amazing kids. And they need me right now. They, they really need me. I need to be here at my house. I need to yeah, be so here for Annie to go to, to Australia. Australia. I need to be here for Annie, my daughter. Because for the past week, she's been waking up in the middle of the night looking under her bed in the closet for her Uncle Joe. <laughs> <laughs> like he's some kind of boogeyman. <laughs> Joe is coming. Joe is the boogeyman Joe, confirmed. This is going to end. This needs to end. This is the most interesting part of the whole promo right here. Watch this. You're not coming back from the land down under. Because that's exactly where I'm going to put you. And I'm not talking about taking your lip body, putting it into a casket and shoveling dirt on it. I'm talking about burying you alive. So they want to fire Samoa Joe. They want to fire Samoa Joe for pretty much trespassing. But then they allow AJ Styles to go on SmackDown Live and I would say elicit acts of or desires of murder against Samoa Joe. Now, I may be nitpicking here, and I may be uh, kind of reaching here, but it doesn't, really, uh, doesn't really excite me. Now, uh, you know, what AJ Styles was saying here, you know, it could have got me excited because I don't know when the last time we seen a Buried Alive match was. Now, I know there was no rules and no count out. There must be a winner. All of those things, all of those rulings are very much in a Buried Alive match. So if they wanted to book a Buried Alive match at the Melbourne Cricket Ground in Melbourne, Australia for the Super Showdown, I would be absolutely okay with that. And I know I'm not the only one listening to this promo that thought that AJ Styles was promoting or pitching a Buried Alive match with Samoa Joe at Super Showdown. In some ways, I wish he was. Now, he got me a little excited there, but then when I realized that it was not a Buried Alive match, then I'd become... Uh, I kind of became disappointed again. 
They, they, they really should have enhanced what Samoa Joe did. They should have they should have showed you the extra clips or the extra footage of Joe entering the house or, or the cops coming to take Joe away or something along those lines. We didn't see Samoa Joe at all. We should have seen a follow-up to what was going on here. WWE was too lazy to give us the evidence. Well, give us the footage. All we got is uh, AJ Styles sounding like he's got the fucking flu here in what is supposedly his home threatening to murder Samoa Joe at Super Showdown. So, WWE, I feel this week, kind of dropped the ball on what is one of the matches or one of the few matches on Saturday night that I'm actually, or Saturday morning in our, in our time zone, 5 a.m., that I'm looking forward to. So, it was kind of disappointing for me on the go-home show here for SmackDown Live. I still think, I know there are a lot of people out there that don't think that Samoa Joe is going to win the WWE Championship. The game is coming out this week, and WWE wants AJ Styles as the, as the WWE Champion going into this uh, $1 million Towers Challenge with WWE 2K19. Fuck all that noise. Okay? You promoted the game as long as you could with AJ Styles as the WWE Champion. I am not going to jeopardize storyline here for the sake of a fucking video game when I know the right man for the job right now is Samoa Joe. Samoa Joe needs to be the WWE Champion. I don't give a fuck if it's a week, a month, or through WrestleMania season. I don't care. Samoa Joe needs to be the WWE Champion. We have lasted this long with AJ Styles, and I love AJ Styles just like everybody else does. One of the greatest wrestlers on the fucking face of the planet. I know. But when a guy has held the title, as long as he has, there comes a point when you kind of feel, this is it. This is the end of the road. Any longer AJ Styles holds the championship, we are going to be calling for him to lose. People are already calling for him to lose. Enough. There's only one man that needs to beat AJ Styles on this roster, and that is Samoa Joe. Simple. I will utter this no longer until uh, until Friday on Off the Script, where we do Super Showdown preview and predictions. Simple as that. Moving on here, man. All Truth and Carmella versus Andrade, Cien Almas, and Zelina Vega. It looks like Andrade, Cien Almas, and Zelina Vega are the duo that will do nothing on SmackDown Live but wrestle in mixed tag team matches. This is what their fate is for the rest of the year. I don't think they're going to factor into any major title storylines here moving forward. But it's quite sad that you got a talent like Andrade Cien Almas and he's kind of stuck in mixed tag team matches on SmackDown Live. When we all know that this guy should be doing so much more. Now, the pairing of R-Truth and Carmella. I'm not going to sit here and tell you that I don't like it. I'm not going to sit here and tell you that I do like it. But, it works. For as many logic gaps that there are in Carmella just magically turning into a babyface for the sake of the Mixed Match Challenge, it works. R-Truth has had... I I don't want to say a resurrection of sorts on SmackDown Live. R-Truth has cozied himself into a role on SmackDown Live as a very good entertainer. I would say somewhat comedy relief. And he's a damn good wrestler. And he's cozied himself into this role with Carmella. And they're really making you forget or not even worry about, well, Carmella was ruining Asuka and on her own reign of terror with the SmackDown Live Women's Championship, that they're not really making you think about that. They're really doing a good job at making you look forward to seeing Carmella and R-Truth. And they may very well be the favorites to win the Mixed Match Challenge with the momentum that they have. Now, on the other hand, I don't believe I'm going to say this. And I've been, I've been anti-Carmella for a very long time. I'm not going to sit here and tell you that uh, I love Carmella all of a sudden, but 
you know, uh, I gotta give credit where credit is due. Carmella as a babyface works so much better as Carmella as a heel. She is so much more enjoyable to watch as a babyface as when she was a heel, I, I couldn't stand the sight of this fucking woman. And everything about her act and everything about her in-ring ability fucking suffered. Carmella is actually a better babyface than she is heel. And she's working a lot better in the ring as a babyface than she did as a heel. You can see that a lot of work has gone into getting at least a little bit better in the ring. My friend Jesse, who was on off the script while I was in Chicago for All In, he mentioned tonight that Carmella and her in-ring work has gotten a lot better from just SummerSlam alone. And with all the negativity surrounding Carmella and the fact that we all shit on Carmella for her lack of in-ring ability, it looks like she took that and she actually applied it to getting better. Now, I'm not going to I'm not going to give her the benefit of the doubt and say that's exactly what happened here, but something has changed in Carmella to a point where she is definitely more enjoyable with our truth than she was with James Ellsworth. And all, all aspects of her act are actually better off for it. That's all I'm going to say. That's all I'm going to say about Carmella. But I hope you guys noticed that as well. Carmella and R-Truth win here. Uh, apparently, Truth and Almas were going back and forth. Now, the one thing... I, this is, again, a nitpicking thing. You know, that's why I hate these fucking mixed, mixed tag team matches. You know, I, I don't expect it to be Lucha Underground where, where Pentagon is given a fucking package pile driver to Ivelisse or, or something like that. But with these mixed tag team matches, we had R-Truth and Andrade Cien almost in the ring. And they're both crawling over to make the hot tag. Andrade Cien almost is crawling over to make the hot tag. Now, they're both doing this and the rules of the match are that no matter what happens, if one of the females is tagged in, the other, the other is all automatically tagged in the match. So they're reaching for the tag like it's some fucking do-or-die situation. If R-Truth tagged Carmella, Zelina Vega was coming in the match anyway, and they made it some big anticlimactic fucking deal. You know? It's ridiculous. That's why I hate these mixed tag team matches. And WWE's been, been doing them a lot more lately. But either way you look at it, we had Almas, you know, have uh, Vega come in. Carmella came in because R-Truth tagged out. And Vega comes from behind and dodges a kick, but Carmella ends up applying her finishing move, the Code of Silence, on Zelina Vega, and she makes Zelina Vega tap out for the win. So, that's what happened there. It wasn't a bad match. It's just, I don't give a shit about it. And it's all for the Mixed Match Challenge to push that fucking stupid shit on Facebook Watch. But Carmella and R-Truth get a victory here. Uh, I would assume this was a practice run for the Mixed Match Challenge. And it came at the cost of Andrade and Zelina Vega. Ty Dillinger approaches, uh, approaches Paige backstage and he says he wants Randy Orton. <clears throat> Excuse me. He wants Randy Orton. Paige is like, well, hello to you too, sir. And Paige says that he defeated Shinsuke Nakamura last week. And technically, and technically, he is due for a United States Championship match. There you go, Ty. So instead of taking the United States Championship match, he would rather risk that and have Randy Orton brutalize him in some fucking sicko fashion. So he says, I will deal with Shinsuke Nakamura at another time, but he wants Randy Orton and he can't let Randy Orton's actions slide. So Paige then points out, you do realize that we have not seen Jeff Hardy since Hell in a Cell. That's because of Randy Orton. And Ty Dillinger doesn't care. He doesn't care. Paige ends up making the match. Ty is happy. And then Paige, I I I'm assuming this was for Del Rio. I never understand men. I don't know why she said that or in the tone that she said it, but Del Rio had some 
disparaging remarks about Paige on Instagram that I am sure she caught wind of. I will never understand men, is what she said. There you go. What business is it of yours? Ty has been a Titus Catering VIP. So give him what he wants, and he will go right back to Titus Catering. At least he's on TV for two weeks. There you go. Ty Dillinger versus Randy Orton on SmackDown Live. The New Day and their fucking pancake... Uh, what's his name? Mr. Bootyworth? Mr. Bootyworth is their fucking pancake mascot. They come to the ring, and apparently they were about to have their pilot for their new cooking show. I don't know what the fucking cooking show was called, but it was Cooking with the New Day. They were going to unveil their new pancake recipe. I'll tell you this right now, okay? Pancakes are on the lower end of the spectrum when it comes to the breakfast hearty foods that are in that category. First of all, I'm taking French toast over pancakes any day of the week, especially when I make them. And B, I prefer a good waffle over a good pancake. Don't at me. Anyway, I know there'll be some fucking goon in the comments section. Oh, JD, why are you so negative against pancakes, man? Tough shit. I like me some fucking waffles better than I do pancakes. So, the new day you're going to unveil their new pancake recipe with Mr. Bootyworth and Seamus and Cesaro come down. They get interrupted by the bar. Seamus says it looks like we have another week of the New Day coming out and acting like children playing with food or, or, or you know, or, or flipping pancakes into the crowd and, and dumping cereal on people. Instead of training for a title match, Wood says the bar is ruining their pilot from being filmed. Cesaro then says, uh, how can you ruin something that's already awful? Uh, how could you ruin something that is already awful? Well, uh, maybe we should, uh, look at Monday Night Raw because they, uh, have proven that fact to be absolutely fucking the easiest task ever. How do you, how do you continue to ruin something that's already ruined? Look at Monday nights? What is Cesaro talking about? All you have to do is turn on the USA Network at 8 p.m. on Monday night to figure out the answer to that fucking question. It's not that hard. Anyway, Cesaro then says they are here to help. Seamus reminds us Cesaro is from Switzerland and the Swiss are exce- exceptional at making pastries. So Se- uh, Seamus then taunts, th- taunts them and then the bar turns the table over and then a-, a breakfast brawl breaks out. Now, this was very reminiscent of what happened on Monday Night Raw because apparently they mixed up the syrups in Titus Catering. Y- you see, Titus got, uh, I-, I think it was uh, Log Cabin maple syrup and he got the Log Cabin light. You see, the guys in the back didn't want that. They, they wanted Mrs. Butterworth. They wanted something a little bit more sugary, a little bit more mapley. This log cabin light shit. Titus has everyone on a fucking diet. He likes he likes the uh, the uh, I guess the less the less artificial flavors or or, or or the less sodium or whatever the fuck uh, the log cabin light is offering for your pancake needs. Everybody wanted Mrs. Butterworth. So this is what happened on Monday. So they're just recreating what happened in Titus Catering here. This is the news I was told. I'm not sure about uh, where you're getting your information from. But I know. I have this. I have the inside scoop. Okay? So a breakfast brawl breaks out here. And Cesaro and Seamus throw flour at the New Day. You know, this is exactly... This is what happens in Titus's kitchens. Just exactly this. Okay? Flour is thrown all over the New Day. The bar takes out Kofi with a ring post shot, delivers the big double backbreaker to Woods. Then they do the big, uh, I guess their finishing move, the white noise off the second turnbuckle there, with Cesaro coming off the top, uh, or the second rope, rather, with Big E. They do that to Big E. The bar then 
go for Mr. Bootyworth. And then they pour their secret pancake mix into his top hat. And they fill the top hat with pancake mix. And they dump it on his head. And then they pour the rest of the pancake mix all over him. And then they yell at him until he leaves the ring. So if I'm WWE production, God bless you. I would not want to be part of the production team that's got to change the ring mats and sweep up after this fucking disaster. This is over the tag team titles, right? Yeah, we're fighting over fucking who makes the best pastry. I hope the bar win in Australia. I really do. I really do. I don't think the New Day with uh, Mr. Bootyworth need to be tag team champions any longer. Ty Dillinger versus Randy Orton, man. This match didn't even get started. This match didn't get started. And when you think Randy Orton can't get more sadistic, this motherfucker proves you wrong time and time again. Now, Dillinger and Orton are brawling on the outside. Dillinger's fighting back. Dillinger's clothesline Orton over the top to the floor. He's slamming him on the fucking table. Orton then tries to slam Ty on top of the table. He blocks it. Ty is fighting back. He's making good here on his promise to Paige. Dillinger then gets on top of the table and starts just grounding and pounding Randy Orton. Orton counters and tosses Dillinger over the barricade. Orton then goes over and hits a draping DDT that knocked Dillinger out cold to the floor. So Randy Orton is thinking, hmm, how can I be a little bit more sadistic here? How how can I one-up what I did to Jeff Hardy? So what Randy Orton does is he takes the protective padding off of the turnbuckle. Now, the, the, the little bar that is in between the steel post and the turnbuckle itself, the one that screws the turnbuckle tight, there's a little hole in between, or a little gap in between that bar. He takes Ty Dillinger's finger and pushes it through the hole, okay? So he stands there, and he's bending his finger in every which way through this little gap in the, in, in the turnbuckle bar, and bending in, I thought I thought legitimately he was gonna fucking snap his finger uh, over this uh, over this bar through the gap, and I thought he was gonna break Ty Dillinger's finger. You know, Ty Dillinger there screaming, and, and the camera was close up on this, and you got a good shot of the grimaces and the facial expressions that Ty Dillinger and Randy Orton, a sadistic fuck, had absolutely the most stone cold look that you could possibly ever have for somebody doing something like that to another human being. I think Randy Orton's great, man. I think Randy Orton is absolutely fantastic. I said this once, and I'm going to say it again. The way Randy Orton is operating right now, he is one of two heels that are being booked booked perfectly here. Samoa Joe and Randy Orton himself. If Randy Orton is continuing on this on this path, it's going to be very difficult to not want to give the WWE title to Randy Orton. That's all I'm saying. This is what I am thinking. I'm going to say it here. Just in case anybody wants to reference this video, this is my prediction here. The WWE title is going to go from AJ Styles to Samoa Joe, Samoa Joe to The Miz, The Miz to Daniel Bryan, and then Daniel Bryan to Randy Orton. That's what I'm thinking. Now, a lot of people are predicting that, you know, Randy Orton's next victim may be Daniel Bryan. And I'm thinking, well, you know, it may be a little bit too soon for that, though it does make perfect sense because you can't really have Randy Orton lose at this juncture. And Daniel Bryan losing is not really going to harm his momentum. So maybe that is a plan that WWE is going to bring to life. I mentioned Rey Mysterio, but there are some setbacks that you really can't have Rey Mysterio feud with Randy Orton, even though it does make sense. You can't have Rey Mysterio lose in his first match back or in his first feud back against Randy Orton, even though it does make sense. So it may very well be Daniel Bryan because Randy Orton stated that his next victim is not Ty Dillinger. He doesn't give a shit about Ty Dillinger. He wants to take Ty out because he hates the fucking 10 chance. And whatever he does to his next victim is going to be worse than what happened to Jeff Hardy. So I don't know. Whatever Randy Orton is doing, it's working. So we get Aiden English and Rusev. Now apparently English comes out. Rusev's already in the ring. Lana is there, looking all downtrodden and sad and worried about what Aiden English is going to say. Aiden English comes out and says that the evidence is right here. But he has some facts about Milwaukee. 
I've never been to Milwaukee. I hear they have good cheese there. I hear that Titus imports a lot of cheese from Milwaukee. That's just what I've heard. I don't know where you get your news and sources from, but that's what I've been told. I don't know. Pepper Jack, Cheddar, Brie. Not talking about botch mode. I'm talking about the cheese. Sharp Cheddar, Swiss. You know, provolone, some mozzarella. You know, a nice sharp cheddar. Uh, what else we got? Um, I said pepper jack. Pepper jack's my favorite cheese. I love, I love me some pepper jack, man. Uh, Munster. You know, the list goes on and on. It's all on Titus's menu. I know, I know. Um, anyway, where am I? English. Aiden English. English says that he is providing context. So English introduces one night in Milwaukee. And the video opens up with English talking into his phone. He's in his hotel room. It looks like English was working on his promo that night in Milwaukee. And there's a knock on the door. So he goes to look through the little peephole. Sees that it's Lana. He opens the door. Lana comes walking in. Lana said she didn't have a lot of time. But she wants to get something off her chest. I don't know. I don't know what that meant, but apparently she wants to get something off her chest. Something she had been thinking about for a long time. So she says, and I quote, I want you, and then the video cuts off. I want you. Did you see the way I accentuated you? I want you, and the video cuts off. Now, if she really said what English is, I guess, blaming her for, she would have said, I want you. The little tone there in the word you would have been directed in a different manner. I want you, I want you to what? I want you to stop watching Monday Night Raw because it is awful. I want you to get me cheddar cheese on behalf of Titus O'Neil could mean anything. It could mean literally anything. I want you to sit next to me in catering. I will be there late, but I want you to get me a glass of orange juice. Could be anything. I want you what? And then the video cuts off. I don't know. So, apparently, English showed us this, but... There was more. And English says that he will reveal it, but he can't do it because he is entertaining a large offer from TMZ. I would have popped if he said Keemstar. I would have actually I would I would have actually marked out if he said drama alert. I'm gonna be pitching an offer to drama alert to show the rest of this footage. Imagine that. Like Keemstar needs the fucking subs and money, right? Um so English says he's entertaining a large offer from TMZ, but he wouldn't want to cheat on them. Rusev and Lana argue in the ring, and Lana says, it's not how it looks. I want you... What? To save me the last slice of cheesecake in Titus Cater. I guarantee you it's nothing. WWE had this great cliffhanger and this great opportunity to really build up Aiden English with this with this silly drama here, and they just left it open for it being anything. I want you. What? I want you. What? Come on, man. Now, if this was the case, right, don't you think that Lana would have filled in Rusev about them being in Milwaukee and then her going to Aiden English's hotel room and telling him the rest of this conversation? I want you. What? It doesn't really depict Lana in, in any uh, nefarious acts here. So I'm kind of disappointed by this. I think WWE dropped the ball on this. But I'm going to give them one more week. We'll see what happens. Apparently there's more footage, and he's shopping an offer to TMZ. It's all that happened there. Daniel Bryan versus Shelton Benjamin. Shelton Benjamin lobbied for this match, or lobbied for a match on, on uh, Twitter, and Paige gave it to him, or WWE gave it to him, because Paige is nothing but a fucking puppet. On this show. She really doesn't book the show there, buddy. 
You know, for the people that are, oh, Paige is booking the show. No, WWE's booking the show. Paige is just out there pretending to be a GM. Dumbass. Shelton Benjamin lobbied for a match, so they gave it to him. And they gave him Daniel Bryan. Now, I mean, this match was too... I guess the match was good for what it was. I mean, I'd like to see more of Shelton Benjamin Peer. I think he's great. All, all, all the, the multi-time championships that he won. And we have, really haven't seen him uh, per uh, this shakeup on SmackDown Live. Ever since, ever since Ch- Chad Gable. Chad Gable has more time with Bobby Roode on Monday Night Raw than Shelton Benjamin has on all of SmackDown Live. I don't understand that. Shelton, ben- Sh- Shelton Benjamin is just as good as Chad Gable. So I don't see why they wouldn't be utilizing a guy of his talent. But this was a good match for what it was. But it did come with a scary fucking instance. Daniel Bryan, I, I don't understand why this guy, and I love Bryan to death, continues to go off the top rope. I thought we were done with Daniel Bryan diving off the top rope for fucking headbutts. He doesn't need to do them. They don't look good. He doesn't hit them anymore. So what is the point of going to the top rope to ultimately miss a headbutt when accidents can happen? And it was neither of their faults. It was just a a spot in the match with an unfortunate situation that could have turned horrific. And thankfully it didn't. Brian came off the top rope for a headbutt. He tried to come batch. Uh, come, come batch. Uh, yes, I would love a, a batch of blueberry muffins, Titus O'Neil. See, I got fucking Titus on my fucking brain now. Uh, Daniel Bryan's coming off the top rope to do a headbutt, and he he misses it, and Shelton Benjamin moved out of the way. But when Shelton Benjamin ro- moved out of the way, Brian and the impact of him missing, they collided heads on the way down. And it wasn't a botch. It was just a a fucking unfortunate happenstance that happened in the match. Now, I doubt people are going to be claiming, oh, Brian, look, he botched. He's in the same league as uh, as his wife now. No. Brian should not be doing headbutts. End the fucking headbutts. Please. We don't need... Another instance where this guy potentially just signed a new contract and then can't wrestle for a fucking concussion. Come on now. No more headbutts. As far as Daniel Bryan's repertoire and moveset, they are completely unnecessary. Stop the headbutts. Shelton Benjamin wins. Miz was on commentary here. He gets up on the apron because he's sick of the yes chants. Bryan was about to mount the comeback here. So he was doing his yes chant in the ring. He was going for the big knee. And then Benjamin obviously takes advantage of this distraction. Brian, stupid babyface syndrome here, like Solomonster says, goes after the Miz, who jumped on the apron. Benjamin catches him with a pay dirt and wins. I would not be surprised if Shelton Benjamin uh, was put over by Daniel Bryan, and Bryan wanted Benjamin to win this match. And this does nothing for Daniel Bryan. A loss here does nothing. This means everything for Shelton Benjamin. In the, in, in the, the newspaper tomorrow... Uh, on, on the results, when you read the results tomorrow morning, Shelton Benjamin defeated Daniel Bryan. That's what it's going to read. So I would not be surprised if Daniel Bryan lobbied for Shelton Benjamin to win this match because he needed it more than anything. So there you go. Oscar versus Peyton Royce. Who the fuck cares? I, I don't really care. I don't. You, you, you could not pay me to care about Oscar at this point. Oscar wins with a submission. Oscar lock. Who cares? They are in one of the most meaningless fucking matches going into Super Showdown. Finally, Becky Lynch and Charlotte. Becky Lynch and Charlotte. The one thing on SmackDown Live that I think has all of our attentions and uh, all of our interests peaked at the maximum level. Becky is in the ring and apparently... There was something that was tweeted out by Becky Lynch about not being featured on the Super Showdown poster. And WWE tweeted out the poster and Becky Lynch was not a part of it. There was legitimately everybody else on the fucking card but Becky Lynch. It makes me think that WWE did this on purpose. Just to do this segment on on Tuesday night. Now, that's me giving them the benefit of the doubt. How likely is it that they left out their SmackDown Live Women's Champion? They cannot be that fucking stupid. 
So I'm assuming it's just uh, for storyline uh, purposes. Becky's in the ring. She talks about how she's the best thing going since she took the title at SummerSlam several weeks ago. She's made the SmackDown Women's Division the hottest thing in WWE. Can't really fault her there. She's definitely made it a lot more interesting. She goes on and shows a video package on the feud with Charlotte Flair. And people are chanting Becky. The video package was excellent. The one thing I would change about the video package was I, I would have included Becky calling Charlotte bitch. Because I thought that was fantastic. So we, we're hearing Becky chants. Becky is 100% babyface. Enough of this, oh, Becky's a heel. No, no, no. that's what WWE wants you to think. Becky is 1,000% babyface here. There's no issue. There's no in-between anymore. It's not in-between tween and Becky. It's babyface 100% Becky Lynch. Becky says she's proven time and time again that she owns Charlotte Flair. Becky says she can't get the respect she deserves. She still can't get the respect that she deserves even though she beat Charlotte and she owns Charlotte. She wonders where her magazine covers are and where her action figures are with the title. Becky goes on about how her face is the face of the company and if no one will give her these opportunities, then she will just take them herself. She shows, she so, shows us the new Super Showdown poster that she designed, uncovering it under a black cloth. The poster featured Becky with her foot on Flair when she attacked her during that photo shoot last week. Becky says, Super Showdown isn't about The Undertaker or Triple H. It's about Becky defending her title for the first time. So she said The Undertaker, Triple H for the last time. No, 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 no. It's about Becky Lynch defending her title for the first time, which wouldn't really be because she defended the title, uh, or, or no, she took the title at at Hell in a Cell. Right? She didn't take the title at SummerSlam. The, the fucking, the, the notes here say she took the title. She's been the best thing going since she took the title at SummerSlam. Good thing I, good thing I noticed that. Did she really say SummerSlam? Or are my notes all fucked up? She took the title at Hell in a Cell. Anyway. This is going to be the first time she's defending the title, I guess. I'm a goon. Oh, well. Charlotte comes out here, and she has a microphone in her hand, and she throws the microphone away, viciously, and she comes into the ring, and they start brawling. Charlotte gets the best of Becky Lynch here. She launches Flair into the poster that was on the poster board, and she gave her a, uh, I guess, an exploded suplex. She tried to apply the figure four, hangs off the apron uh, to tighten the hold. Fans are chanting Becky Lynch here, and Flair is getting booed out of the building. So Flair delivers her signature woo and stands over Becky, and the announcers are hyping the match for Saturday night. Charlotte is the heel. And Becky is the babyface. The fans have spoken. There is no in-between here. And, and there's no reason why people are going to boo Becky Lynch. No. They're 100% for Becky and 100% against Charlotte. That's what they're doing here. There's no in-between goons on social media. Get with the program. I don't know what the fuck show you're watching, but Becky is no longer a heel. She was never a heel. She was always a babyface. Charlotte was always the one who did wrong here. There's no reason for people to boo, to boo Becky Lynch whatsoever. She is not a victim here, even though WWE wants to portray her as one. She is not the victim. Charlotte is the one who fucked up. There you go. Anyway, I'm getting out of here, man. This is SmackDown Live Review. Hope you guys enjoyed it. Did the best I could for a show that really tried to do too much but offered little, little to nothing for Super Showdown. I, I think they, they pretty much established what they wanted to do with Super Showdown, and this was just like, ah, we're going to go on for uh, two hours just to get to Australia. Whatever. That's the kind of show it was, man. But I'm getting out of here. I will be back tomorrow with NXT. Then we got the May Young Classic, so we'll do that. And then uh, we will get ready for another weekend of Off the Script, as always, man. If you guys missed Monday Night Raw Review, that is linked in the annotation that you see in the top right corner. 2,000 likes on this video is very well appreciated, man. That's the goal here. 
Follow me on Twitter at JD from NY206. And if you guys want to support through the Patreon page, patreon.com slash JD from NY206, man. I'll see you guys for NXT tomorrow night. Um, I don't know. What, what do we got tomorrow night in the main event? We got Pete Dunne. We got Ricochet and Adam Cole for the North American title. There we go, man. There we go. Or maybe is it EC3 versus Lars Sullivan and then the following week is that North American title. Whatever it may be, it's NXT. And it's the A Show. I'll see you guys later.